Soon after the Big Bang, the universe was full of very hot, high-pressure plasma. Such that the density fluctuations that produced in the Big Bang, they oscillate backwards and forwards like, like sound waves. 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe becomes sufficiently cold and these sound waves are frozen. These have propagated a huge distance equal to about 500 million light years. And it's this fundamental length scale that we set out to measure. Professor Sean Cole was born in 1963, a time of space missions and Star Trek. I had an interest in, in space and astronomy from a very early age. At school, I, I had a natural aptitude for, for maths and physics. He opted to study physics at Oxford because he could do astronomy from the first year. He did his PhD at Cambridge and postdoc at UC Berkeley. I like to study the big question of where did the universe come from? What's the density of the universe? What's its age? How do galaxies form in this big cosmos? Sean Cole joined the University of Durham in 1991, becoming professor in 2005. Perhaps the area where I've made the biggest contribution is in terms of modelling structure formation in cosmology. Structure forms in a hierarchical fashion. This is just a, a picture that I drew back in the 90s. A merger tree. We can then use that as the backbone for modelling galaxy formation. This is done with big supercomputers now to model that formation. In 1994, at a conference in Edinburgh, Sean was roped into the breakthrough 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey that won the Shaw Prize this year. A survey was done beforehand, optical imaging, so we know where all the galaxies are. The 2DF survey involved over 30 scientists in Britain and Australia using the 4-metre Anglo-Australian telescope with a 2-degree field. A robotic instrument that can place an optical fibre on each galaxy and take the light back to a spectrograph. We could get 400 galaxy spectra every hour or so. The 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey comprised a quarter of a million galaxy spectra. We can determine the redshifts of these galaxies and hence their distance away from us. And that enables us to build up a, a three-dimensional map of the galaxies. The critical thing is the galaxies are not just randomly distributed, they're distributed in large-scale structure, in, in filaments and walls. By measuring that structure, we were able to detect a length scale called the baryonic acoustic oscillation length scale, which is equal to sound speed in the early universe times the age of the universe when those waves stop propagating. The amplitude of that is very hard to predict. It's a real progress in science. Hey. Excited, naturally, but it also seemed that not that many people would be interested. It was a very academic uh, topic. But BAOs have become more important because they're a fundamental yardstick to do basically very large-scale surveying of the geometry of the universe, which in turn tells us about the expansion history of the universe. And the big question today is, what is driving the accelerating expansion of the universe? Sean has been fantastic uh, working with. He was certainly very much heavily involved in the analysis. He's been always very focused. So Sean's a, a theoretician, so he did a lot of very careful work figuring out if we understood how we were measuring the properties of the galaxies across the sky. And then move to the exciting results from a rock solid basis. He has a really nice knack of when you tell him something stupid, he tells you very gently and calmly in a rational way that your idea is stupid, right? He's very patient and very smart. He's uh, one of the most outstanding scientists in the world. He seemed to be very modest about what he has done. He comes up with lots of great ideas and unusual ideas. He's very inspirational for the young postdoc. Professor Shang respects your idea, so even if we are a very young scientist. He's very nice and very kind to everyone. He works both on observational data and uh, computational simulation data. It is very important to the development in cosmology and the galaxy evolution. 
taking a, a mathematical model and seeing it work out in the data, logical order, I think, is <laughs> what rewards me. His life seems just as orderly. I had no great plans. Just opportunities seemed to arise. I, I got to the end of my school. People said, you should apply to university. I got to the end of my degree. They said, you should consider doing research. And I certainly believe if you take on a task, then you want to do it as best you can. Sean from Lancashire met Maggie from Yorkshire on a skiing holiday in Andorra. We went independently of each other. Sean actually sat next to me and my friend on the plane and I was teasing her. She was laughing at what I was saying to her. And I was thinking, cheeky devil. They met up again. There wasn't enough snow, so we ended up going into a bar instead. <laughs> Got talking and so yeah. on, yes. Back in England. I was just finishing off my PhD. I was nursing in Middlesex. Then Sean spent two years working in California. We had some very good holidays in the States. We climb up this mountain. Then we got to the top and he proposed to me. I made him wait until the morning until I decided whether I was going to marry him or not. I think she was scared <laughs> I was going to leave her up the mountain. <laughs> Settling in Durham, the couple has two kids, 21-year-old Hannah, currently studying media in Bournemouth, and Daniel, 15. Let's go. One at a time. Sean helped the kids with homework. Yeah, it's very good with that. But I don't really need help with it because it's quite easy. You know Would you I mean? like to follow in your father's footsteps? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm more sort of chemistry, sort of orientated. So at the moment, yeah. he's, he's um, thinking about being a pyrotechnician. So Dan Daniel and I like going uh, cycling and mountain biking. My passion at the moment is the allotment. What are you going with? Potatoes, cabbages, tomatoes, leeks, beetroots, beans. She doesn't trust me to do the weeding though, because I might pull out the wrong thing. <laughs> do you understand what he does? No. <laughs> I'm really proud of him, yeah. He yeah. does work hard, doesn't he, Dan? It's his passion. Ali's always thinking about something. Mainly what I did wrong the day before. You know, yeah. <laughs> and looking ahead, Certainly uh, wanting to get involved in, in future projects that are, are going to constrain dark energy. Uh, and in fact, John Peacock and myself are in a collaboration with Daniel Eisenstein uh, that uh, may be doing this in, in the future. Professor John Peacock of Edinburgh University took over the reins of the Anglo-Australian 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey in 1999. As chairman, your, your, your main task, of course, is to, to make sure that everybody feels involved and, and informed. On the whole, we were a very happy family. There were challenges. Well, one example was, I said, to make the survey work, you need a, an image of the sky data taken on photographic plates. We realised well, after starting the survey, the depth of the photographs wasn't quite uniform, so um, that had to be recalibrated. Prior to the 2DF project, the biggest such survey had been about um, 12,000 galaxies, whereas we pushed that up to a quarter of a million, so it was a huge leap forward for, for its day. New Anglo-Australian surveys are underway completed now a survey of close to 400,000 galaxies, really going to, to much greater distances. We probably know the redshifts of something like 3 million galaxies. Between 2020 and 2025, approximately, we'll measure the redshifts for 25 million galaxies. Over the whole sky, there's maybe 100 billion galaxies. I could imagine you know, the significant fraction of that could have been observed by the year 2050. There's a period in, in the history of science when you go from knowing nothing to, to your knowledge saturating. We're right on the cusp of that at the moment. So it's an immensely exciting time. These days, it's all on the computer. For the 2DF survey. Mainly the observations were done between 1997 and about 2002. We released all the final data in 2003 and the final science results in 2005. John has written a cosmology textbook and collaborated in 230 project papers. 
these days the, the world of cosmology is much bigger. So there are, there are huge teams of, of people working on big survey projects. So I find myself these days going off into smaller projects where I feel I've actually left an imprint on the work. The 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey wasn't the first to see the existence of large-scale structure, but what we were able to do was to measure it much more precisely. Including the baryonic acoustic oscillations. You reach a point in the early universe where the sound speed drops, the baryon effects, and it's frozen in a fixed pattern into the, the clustering of galaxies, and its length never changes after that. This length scale is being used to measure accelerating cosmic expansion. And the direct inference, if you believe that Einstein's theory of gravity is the correct one, is that there's this additional substance that permeates all of space, which has these anti-gravity properties, which has this name dark energy. By now, everybody is convinced that either we have to change the theory of gravity or dark energy is a reality. We've all stood outside on a dark night and looked up and thought, what, what on earth is all this about? So it's, it's a great thing about being a professional astronomer to know that you're able to get paid to do something that everybody can feel the importance of. But John Peacock, who was born in Dorset, England, of radio operator parents, started at Cambridge University intending to be a chemist. I realised after a year that physics was much easier, so I dropped chemistry. But after his undergrad studies... Many of the jobs on offer didn't seem so appealing. So he stayed at Cambridge for a PhD in astronomy. In astronomy, and particularly in cosmology, you have to bring so many pieces of physics together. He started his postdoc in 1981 at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. We're now seen as one of the, the world centres of extragalactic and cosmological research. In 1998, Peacock was transferred to be a professor at the University of Edinburgh. John is so impressive because he, he understands the, the data, the technology, but also theory, and, he, and he, he does the equations and the calculations himself. He just does everything. These days, actually, the precision of the data is such that it's harder and harder to be able to write down a neat formula. And in the end, you just have to do a big computer simulation to, uh, to get the exact answer. His knowledge is vast. You can ask him about pretty much anything. But if John doesn't know it, probably no one's worked out yet. <laughs> you haven't, I hope. <laughs> it was quick as a joke. Life yes. is about trying to balance selfish Do pleasure, of of enjoying yourself, and being nice to the people around you. John's a very pleasant guy. He um, um, likes being host in his house. We have institute parties there. He also has 50 clarinets at home. Here's one that was made in about 1890. Here's one that's made up 100 years later. I like understanding how the, um, the engineers thought about how to make the thing work better. And also, I like restoring them so it was covered in rust. Now, it can make music again. John started on the clarinet in secondary school. Anybody could be offered free instrument tuition. It's become a great love of my life. John has played in hundreds of classical concerts. Through music, John, a student in Cambridge, met Heather, a nurse in London. We used to go up to Cambridge to sing with John's friend. Sit. Oh, good boy. He was so funny, he threw me in the fountain. <laughs> so it was the sense of humour. That's how I show her affection. Yes. <laughs> she was, um, she would say, straightforward <laughs> and plain speaking. John and Heather married in 1982. Their kids, Duncan, Imogene and Sophie, are in their 20s. None of you went into the sciences. I'm just not very good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my skills are best placed elsewhere. <laughs> Let's just say that. So we've had long conversations about things, but I am not a scientist. So generally it's at a very low level. I'm very proud of my dad for Aww. the achievements that he's he's made in his career and I think it's wonderful. 
So sometimes I bring home a pretty picture and I say, look at this. So what is it? And you start to explain and then you find there's nobody left. <laughs> Dad used to take us swimming, um, go play sports together, you know, play in the garden, you know, play these out. instruments oh. together. A tradition in that family is to build dams, uh, streams. Edinburgh is always special to me. I want to move back here when I'm finished studying and live here the rest of my life. I used to take you to nursery in the back of my bike, didn't I? That was great fun. If you cycle like I do, um, half an hour is enough time to get you from anywhere to anywhere. It offers everything that a civilised existence requires. I'm going to stay in Edinburgh the rest of my life. Apache Point Observatory, New Mexico. This telescope is the main workhorse of an ambitious project in the United States to make the biggest, most detailed three-dimensional map of the universe. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS. It's a two and a half meter telescope, one of the most powerful telescopes in the world. It's not one of the larger telescopes in the world. This telescope has actually detected some of the very furthest objects in the universe. What makes it so impressive is the very large field of view the size of 36 uh, full moons. Harvard University astronomy professor Daniel Eisenstein is a co-winner of this year's Shaw Prize for leading a group of SDSS researchers to find a novel way to measure the distance and distribution of galaxies based on baryonic acoustic oscillations, sound waves that echoed in the early universe that provided astronomers with a cosmic ruler. The sound waves get started at the Big Bang and they, they finish uh, when the universe becomes neutral uh, about 400,000 years after the, after the Big Bang. And in that period of time, they can travel a very particular distance. Uh, the universe has expanded since that time, so that distance is now much larger. It's, but that distance is a very characteristic distance that we can test. We start with um, taking images of the sky. The bright spots are lights from distant galaxies. Their positions in the sky are reproduced on this metal plate. This is an example of, of one of the plates that we use in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So each hole here represents the location of where uh, the light from a distant galaxy or star is going to fall when the telescope is pointed in just the right location. We've done about 6,000 of, uh, of these individual plates. In each of these holes on the back side of the plate, we would plug a little optical fiber. The plate with optic fibers is placed in this black cartridge. It's mounted on the telescope. The telescope turns at the exact location in the sky it had earlier photographed. We're just going to sit there and stare at it for an hour. We're able to collect uh, the light from many such points on the sky. Then enters into an optical fiber, which then travels off uh, to our spectrographs. The redshift of the light's wavelength is analyzed to calculate the distance and distribution of galaxies. The spectroscopic data is allowing us to make a three-dimensional map. Maps usually have a scale on them that says, you know, one centimeter equals one kilometer. And we don't have that scale. But once we find a characteristic uh, pattern in the map, then we can infer the scale. Daniel's study and the Anglo-Australian 2DF Redshift Survey both released findings in 2005 of the same pattern. One of the uh, key patterns that we're looking for is a signature of sound waves mm -hmm. that propagated in the first 400,000 years after the Big Bang. A pond of water might be a way of visualizing this effect. 
If you drop the rock into the pond, that's the location that one galaxy will form at. But that rock then creates a wave which travels out, um, and where that wave ends, then that's going to preferentially create conditions for other galaxies to form. If we have one galaxy here, we are slightly more likely to have another galaxy 500 million light years away. We are able to use this 500 million light year distance as our meter stick. And then we can see them yet again, their imprint 10 billion years after the Big Bang. It gives this, this so much leverage. I just studied the expansion history of the universe. The expansion rate of the universe is accelerating today. We have no idea why this is happening. The name we give to it uh, is dark energy. I sometimes joke that this overstates our knowledge by a factor of two, because all we really know is that it's dark. <laughs> we don't even know that it's really energy. Um, so it really is, um, it's, it's one of the great mysteries in physics today. How did you get into astronomy? I was very, uh, you know, active and interested in mathematics and science in high school. He majored in physics in Princeton University in 1992 and took his doctorate in astronomy at Harvard in 1996. I actually came more from the physics and math uh, side and I only learned my astronomy uh, rather late, um, really rather different entrance into the field. But I think that speaks to the breadth of the field, that it really is unifying mathematics, physics, astronomy, and computing, and statistics, and now even chemistry and biology. Daniel now heads the third SDSS survey that began in 2008 and ends this year. It analyzed light from 1.5 million galaxies. It's been an amazing a uh, few months. First, he was elected to the prestigious U.S. National Academy of Science that advises the country on science and technology. I was elected to the National Academy a few weeks before I, I received the, the news of the Shaw Prize, and then uh, my second son was born uh, three days ago. So it's in, in a one three-month period, there have been th three major events. Right now, a lot of my focus is on family. So my first son is three and a half years old, so that's been very occupying. <laughs> you can see I have five hands, and so I, I juggle constantly. <laughs> uh, no, it's just, um, it's, uh, these are good problems to have. He's always actually been phenomenal. I work closely with Daniel on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You know, he started as a theorist, but he, he became very observational uh, and, and developed this, and that's usually a talent that most theorists never uh, can't do, let alone uh, do, and he does it with uh, an exceptional quality. I've known Daniel for 10 years. He is a very understanding, very you know, warm uh, individual that really tries to understand that everyone has a different pace, everyone has a different ideas, and all of these are welcome at the table. We do science to work on the questions that we know about now, and in the process of answering those questions, we hope to uncover the next generation of questions. Mm -hmm.